Hi everyone, great to see you here. Excited that we're all um, here together to think about the, the future of our industry. The, the thing that helps me um, understand the world myself is just to see it in a historical context and understand kind of where we've come and how we've got to this point and where we're gonna be going next. The, the way I view the work in our industry is really that it's about creating a new kind of truth for how society can function. So historically, uh, societies have been very heavily driven by their idea of what's true. What's true and what's not true, frankly, determines uh, a lot of what happens. The first versions of what's true were really stories and myths and religions, which gave people a certain pattern of how to understand the world. And that was what guided a lot of society. Then we went on to what's known uh, as sci science, scientific truth, where basically science started to define truth. Science started to say, this is how the truth works now. This is what's true and untrue. And that's been happening for, for hundreds of years. In recent times, uh, I think we arrived at something that I consider to be paper truth. Basically truth uh, that's written on a piece of paper or that's digitized or whatever. But that truth uh, doesn't really relate back to reality. And there's more and more of it and more and more of it determines things about our life in a very strange way. Uh, I think we are all part of creating what I consider to be cryptographic truth, where the world is forced to coincide with what is being represented to you. So cryptographic truth basically guarantees you that whatever is being told to you is the way the world is up to a certain point. Another way to view this uh, economy is the difference between uh, paper promises and cryptographic promises. So for example, paper promises are money in your bank account, which the bank could decide not to give you. Cryptographic truth is when you have a private key and you control something directly yourself. And the only thing that could ever lead to you not controlling that thing is if math and encryption stop working. This is a very big difference. Because in one world, you have people writing things down on paper. They show you the paper. They have a nice logo. They've been around for a few hundred years. There's legal stuff. Uh, there's more paper behind the other paper. There's more paper behind that. But then at the end of the day, uh, as we all know, they can simply decide not to give you or not to do or not to act in the way that they promised, which is very problematic and where the past large failures of my generation, your generation, and many other generations uh, in the past have come from. Good examples are like the 2008 financial crisis, various other problems, most recently SVB, and probably a lot of fun stuff to come. So I view all of us as making a separate system, an alternative system, that cryptographically guarantees the future. That when you are given something, and something is represented to you, not only can you verify how it works, not only can you check every aspect of how it works, but it will always work in that way. This sense it is deterministic. And this deterministic property is something that I think uh, is what our makes uh, us and our industry unique. We uh, are basically in the cryptographic truth business. That's what we do. We provide huge amounts of cryptographic truth, the most in history, to these things called blockchains, which are basically like cryptographic truth processing and storage machines, where you have contractual conditions and contractual outcomes executed by this cryptographic truth. So far, the cryptographic truth that we've created has generated uh, over $8.5 trillion worth of transaction value. So not only are we putting cryptographic truth onto these systems and into these places, but that cryptographic truth is being used to generate valuable, unique transactions that were previously impossible to generate because you didn't have cryptographic truth. This is what we have evolved to today. Um, I think Chainlink will evolve very far uh, beyond all of this, in my expectation. But generally speaking, where we are today is that we were able to provide data, compute, and now cross-chain value. These are really the three things that you need to build an advanced application that can cryptographically guarantee outcomes for people. 
you need data to prove what happened. You need computation to basically compute the conditions of the, of the agreement in addition to what's on a blockchain. And you need cross-chain connectivity to connect the agreement to other sources of value so that value can flow into the agreement. So let, let's just take these problems one by one. Problem number one, data. If you control the data, you control the contract. So there's a long history of people controlling data to manipulate markets. Um, our industry isn't immune to this. There, before the appearance of Oracle Networks and the work that we do, there was a lot of data manipulation. There's a good amount of data manipulation after, but luckily for us, not on our networks. And so the problem is that if you give data to a contract and that data is controlled by someone else, then that person controls the contract, which is not deterministic, which is not guaranteed, which is just one person controlling the thing. And that means they can decide to do whatever they want with it. The second problem is computation. Um, you do need additional computation beyond what blockchains do because blockchains don't do the computation that's needed to make advanced smart contracts. So there's no privacy on blockchains. There's all kinds of computations that just aren't possible. And there's various computations that probably won't be possible for a long time. Well, when you have this problem and you still need to do the computation and you put it somewhere else, like in a centralized server, guess what? Somebody now controls the contract. Not so good because the point is not for them to control the contract. The point of the contract is to be deterministic, is to be guaranteed against manipulation because we want a cryptographically truth powered world. The third problem is bridges. Right? Bridges are basically these connectivity points that control the value in the system. So you might have value in the system, you might have value in the contract, but if someone hacks the bridge that gave you the value, then your contract loses the value. That's not so good, because now you have another dependency called this bridge thing, and if the bridge isn't secure, then your contract isn't secure, because once again, if someone can crack the bridge, they can take the money from your contract. And if one person can crack the bridge, guess what? It's not secure and it's not deterministic. It's not the world that you wanted. So this is what we solve. We solve the ability to provide data, to provide compute, and provide cross-chain connectivity to create um, safe, real, smart contracts. Not smart contracts connected to some place someone controls the data, or the server, or the cross-chain bridge but somewhere where you can have advanced smart contracts that can access data, compute, and value to become highly advanced, highly scalable, and basically remain deterministic and secure. And, and by the way, this is the process I've in, our industry has been going through for, for years, right? It basically, our, our industry grows to a certain point, and then it hits the limits of the technology, and then it has a failure. And that failure sets the industry back, and everyone says, woe is us, it's, you know, maybe it's not real. It's real, it's just an incremental process, right? Because you hit the limits of what's possible, and when you find the limits, that's when you can kind of set a new limit, and then you build, and you hit that limit. Uh, but, but, you know, things are getting better along the way, right? Because the limits are always getting better. You know, the limit's getting farther. You're, you're always building more, or more advanced stuff. So the world that I think, uh, I'm pretty sure at this point, this is going to result in uh, one way or another, is uh, what we're calling the Internet of Contracts. But basically, it's a hyper-connected, globalized world where people in Korea can launch applications, people in Singapore can launch applications, people in you know, Europe and, and the US and anywhere else can launch applications. And those applications can interact with each other, and they can rely on each other. So if I build an application and you build an application, our two applications can interact and your application can never screw over my users and my application can never screw over your users because no one's going to make a choice about how to screw over anybody because it's not possible to make that choice because that choice has disappeared. And then you can have all these applications that all these smart people build and connect. You'll see a lot of these smart folks up here today, they'll be giving you know, talks and discussing what the future of their projects is. And our goal is to build the infrastructure that allows those smart people that you'll hear from today here at the meetup to build these more advanced applications 
and get them connected into this internet of contracts. And then um, once that happens, I think the amount of value that people will be able to get from that internet of contracts will be very, very far beyond the current uh, internet, right? Because the current internet, while it's very good at transmitting information, it isn't good at making sure that what you were promised is what happens, right? Like you can have a password for a bank account and you can transmit the password over the internet to the bank account, but the bank account can still choose not to give you the money. That's a big problem because the world that we're moving towards in the global markets is a world where more and more bank accounts will probably start choosing not to give people their money, unfortunately. Um, but luckily for us, there's a nice alternative that we're all actively working on. The, the final piece of this puzzle, in, a, in addition to data and compute, that was uh, relatively recently released uh, this year, is CCIP, the Cross-Chain Interoperability Protocol. CCIP seeks to act similarly to TCPIP, um, which is what unified the, a separate set of internets into the internet because you actually had separate technologies that were not compatible, defining the early versions of the internet, and then TCP IP came along and unified them through a communication system that allowed those different technologies to interact with each other, even though they were different, and to create the internet. So now we've made CCIP using all the experience of um, our work on Chainlink and our community's work on Chainlink, to make a secure bridge that can create this internet of contracts. So that instead of having to choose a single chain, you don't need to know the chain. Just like you don't know the server running your apps, right? You don't know whether your apps run on AWS or GCP or Azure or what, and you don't care because it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that the apps do something valuable. So the, the, the more that we can connect all of these blockchains into a single unified network that provides value to people, the sooner our industry can provide value and the more value can flow into it. One place where there's a huge amount of value to be found is the banking sector. Believe it or not, banks have all the value in the world. It's where everybody keeps all their value. And so it's one of those places where if the value from banks were to move into our industry, that would be a very big deal because we're not talking about millions or billions. We're talking about hundreds of trillions. And hundreds of trillions going into a $1 trillion industry, I'll let you do the math on that. But it's a big increase, very big increase. So what we're working on now with CCIP is actually connecting banks in different regions to each other so they can do interbank transactions. Those interbank transactions are the beginning of banks starting to use blockchains to actually transmit value. Once the banks transmit value, they're gonna wanna transmit more value because that's what banks do. They like to transmit value. They make money from it. The other great benefit of this is that as the banks put more, va more value on chain and as they transmit more value and as they're technically able to transmit more value, the public chain world will get a portion of that value because some of the value will be transmitted to other banks and some of the value will be transmitted into public chains. And so our industry will either quickly or slowly get a portion of the bank value, also known as the global financial system. Depending on how quickly that accelerates, I think we'll eventually arrive at a world like this, where you have multiple different bank chains connected, and those connected bank chains are able to send value to public chains. And not only are they able to send value to public chains, but the legal barriers that preclude them from sending value to public chains are gone. Right? Why do banks not send value to public chains now? Is it because they don't want to sell things to people? It's because there's no legal clarity. There's this big wall between them and all these people that want what they make. But once that wall goes down, and it will go down 
within the next three to five years, because basically the question of what is the right framework for banks to work with consumers on all this is being forced into, into existence, like painfully forced into existence, but nonetheless forced into existence. And so what we're gonna arrive at eventually is a world where DeFi applications communicate with DeFi applications, banks communicate with banks, ideally all using CCIP as their messaging and interoperability system. And then because they're both on the same messaging and interoperability standard, we can arrive at a world where the banking sector and the crypto sector is just the global financial system. Because if you talk to people in banks or you talk to people in DeFi or you talk to people anywhere and you present them with the choice of would you like a reliable application that cannot deviate from your expectations or would you like an unreliable application where people can change their mind whenever they want. I'm yet to meet the person who understands the question, tell me, yes, I would love the unreliable application where people can keep my money and I can be broke. What a nice application, what a valuable feature. Yet to find that person after talking about this with thousands of people. So I think where we're gonna end up is cryptographically guaranteed truth, uh, deterministically guaranteed relationships, um, and, a, and a world where people can rely on systems and applications in a way where those systems cannot change their mind is what is gonna eventually define what the global financial system is. Our goal um, really is to work with great teams, like some of the teams you'll hear about today, who are gonna tell you about what they're building, and um, to enable those teams to build the next generation of applications that allows people to get value from this deterministic, cryptographically guaranteed property. Um, to do that, we and the community uh, surrounding Chainlink has worked very hard on providing the data, the computation, and now the cross-chain value and this for me, um, I wouldn't say it creates like a fully feature complete version of Chainlink, but I think it creates a version that has about almost everything you need to build an advanced application in a deterministic cryptographically guaranteed way. And I'm really thrilled that there are so many people um, now continuing to build and even more great people coming into the industry. And historically what I've seen after being in the crypto industry since 2010, and basically seeing every cycle in the industry so far, is that the stuff that gets built in this period is the stuff that goes on to define the growth of the next period. Because this is the time when people build the most advanced things. So we're just um, absolutely thrilled to be able to provide all this um, by building Chainlink and by the Chainlink community helping us bring it into existence and very grateful to all the great teams working with us uh, through Build, giving us feedback, many of which you're here from today. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the meetup.